awoken by love. And then I wake, sky splayed in reverberating reverence, a heart beating, beating, beating. Surprised yet again am I by love and only love. Good morning. Welcome to Roncesvalles United Church. It's Sunday, September 5th, and we're getting ready for the big pivot. What's the big pivot? Well, pivot is a word that we have all learned and adapted to during this time of COVID. But the pivot for us is that instead of having a morning recorded service, we are moving on Sunday, September 12th to in-person services. That's right. On Sunday, September 12th at 10.30, you can walk back in the front doors, sit in the pews, socially distanced with your mask on, hand sanitizer will be used, and you can have a service in person. But for those of you who would still like to watch online instead, we're going to record some parts of the morning service. Sid will work his magic on editing in the afternoon on Sunday. And sometime late Sunday afternoon or early evening, we'll see how that works out, we're going to post highlights of the morning service. So we are asking you to pivot in either coming to church at 1030 on Sunday morning for in person or changing your morning recording uh, watching on Sunday to an evening recording watching on Sunday. This will be on our website, so if I have just confused you, you'll be able to see what's happening. I know that some of us will be together on Sunday the 12th in the sanctuary, some of us will continue to be watching online, and that all of us will continue to feel a part of Roncesvalles United Church. So welcome to everyone, whether you're sitting in the pews at any point or watching online, we're so glad you're here. Paul Gowdy is still providing music for us, and we thank him. He's going to start us off with Like a Mighty River Flowing. It's one of our favorite hymns. And you'll see the words on your screen, and you can sing along. Thanks, Paul. adventure today takes us to the book of Hosea. We are now in a section called the Minor Prophets. The Minor Prophets are not minor because they're uh, not important in what the message is, and they're certainly not minor in how loud their voices are, these 12 prophets. They are minor because they're super short little books. And I have to say, as I have reacquainted myself with the Minor Prophets, I am so glad they are super short little books. Because they are very, very hard people to read. In fact, I will share with you that as I was preparing to read Hosea, or talk about Hosea this week, I read the book of Hosea through twice. And on my third reading through, I heaved my Bible across the room. <laughs> breaking the spine, but it was very satisfying. It was satisfying because Hosea sounds like this. Mac? Okay. This is from Hosea, chapter 1, verse 2. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of harlotry, and have children of harlotry. 
For the land commits great harlotry for forsaking the Lord. So right off the bat, they're all harlots. It gets better. Can you read another passage? Yep. Now we're on chapter 2, verse 11. Yeah. And I will put an end to all her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts. And I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, These are my hire, which my lovers have given me. I will make them a feast, and the beasts of the field shall devour them. So everybody's a harlot, and we're all going to get devoured by wolves, okay, basically. Um, flip over a few pages, and what have we got? Okay, now we're at chapter 7, verse 12. As they go, I will spread over them my net. I will bring them down like birds of the air. I will chastise them for their wicked deeds. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Yeah. Destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. Yeah, and it really just goes on like that, okay? And you have my permission to do what I felt like doing, if you wish. Yeah, okay? Thank you very much for that, Mac. Now, I'm going to change the way we feel about this for just a second. I'm going to suggest that there is a message here for us. I'm going to suggest that, having guaranteed to you that it took me a long time to find it. Um, and I'm going to invite you to say a little prayer that's going to invite spirit into our minds right now. So, Sid, could you put those words on the screen, please? God, I come to you today to seek the peace that you alone can give. I come in silence, in the quiet of my heart, the deep recesses of my mind. I wait and listen for your voice. Speak to me today. I come in certainty and love, sure that you will hear my call and answer me. If you watched our video last week, or if you were one of the few present for our recording, you may remember that I started by inviting you all to repeat some words. And the words were, I rule my mind, which I alone must rule. I rule my mind, which I alone must rule. The idea behind it was that we are charged with ruling our own kingdom, our mind. We ask God to help us rule it with peace, with love, with compassion and understanding. We pay attention to the times that we are not ruling our own minds. The words that I chose for this week are a little different, but they really feed into that idea of having a peaceful kingdom. The words for this week are, today I judge nothing that occurs. Today I judge nothing that occurs. I rule my mind, which I alone must rule. How do I keep that peace? Well, to start with, today I judge nothing that occurs. Think about what your life would be like if you actually did that. Think about the busyness of your mind as it judges during the day. We are told that within the time of seeing something, perceiving something, experiencing something, and forming a judgment about it, there are nanoseconds. Such a short time that we can't even measure it. By the time the thought has come in or the situation is ascertained, we have already decided this is how I feel about it. And even more than that, we have probably formed a set opinion, and it's going to be hard, we're told, sometimes to shift it. So, to say, today I will judge nothing that occurs, well, that's a pretty big task for sure, because my mind is trained to judge. Everyone around me's mind is trained to judge. We all judge each other, and I feel judged all the time. This is simply a way that our mind has worked that is certainly disturbing our peace. But we're so used to it. We almost don't think it's there, and if we see it, we think we can't still it. But I want to rule a peaceful kingdom. And if I want to rule my kingdom in peace, then I'm going to look at how and what 
how often I judge things. How often do I feel like I have to exert my opinion about things? How often am I in that situation, in fact, when I think having an opinion is a virtue, it's a necessity, I have to have it, I gotta know how I feel about this, and I probably have to tell other people too. Well, there is a problem with deciding that this is a way you want to go, even if it's a better way to go. And the problem is that whatever we ask for, we will indeed receive. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if I say to the universe, to my God, to my guide, please make me more patient, something will immediately occur which will give me an opportunity to practice patience. If I say to my God, please help me to have an open mind, something will immediately be put in my path which will challenge me to practice having an open mind. God doesn't simply change us all of a sudden, but God absolutely provides us with whatever we need to learn the lessons we think will bring us peace. So sure enough, as I decided that my lesson for this week was, today I will judge nothing that occurs. I will simply experience it in peace, knowing that I don't know the whole picture. I only see a tiny part, and I certainly don't know the best way for this to play out. God knows that. As I said to myself today, I will achieve peace by not judging anything. What happened? The news happened. Afghanistan happened. Hurricanes due to our lack of care for the planet happened. Things in my family happened. A person in my family who I find very challenging and who I want to judge regularly, because they're wrong, okay, happened. God did what God does. Do you want to learn the peace of not judging? Great. Practice on this. It happens every time, and it happens immediately. And not only did it happen in the world around me, as circumstances came up that I said, I know what this is right, what is right here. I know what to think about this. And took it a step further. And everybody around me needs my opinion. I was also faced with the book of Hosea. 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 His name means salvation. All I could think as I read the Hosea was, save me from Hosea. Hosea is a tough, tough book to read. It's a short book, and in that book he packs a lot of wrath, and a lot of unhappiness, and a lot of judging. The general story of Hosea is that Hosea is a prophet, which means that he's supposed to be telling people what God's will is. And Hosea is told by God, go out and marry, well, most translations say a harlot, or a whore, or a prostitute. In fact, most reasonable religious scholars would say that was a term applied to a woman who worshipped a foreign god. And we see that through the book of Hosea. It becomes clear that what Hosea's wife does is she has a different faith. She worships a different god. She probably comes from a different culture, although in that time and in that place where Hosea was, they were living with many different faiths together. But in Hosea's mind, this was an ultimate sin. So her adultery was not that she had strayed from her husband, but that she had strayed from her husband's god. That is how adultery is usually used in the Old Testament, and it is always applied to women. Why is it applied to women? Because of the conscientious, the consistent diminishment, determined eradication of the female divine in worship. Okay? Why do we direct this wrath at women? Why is it women who are being idolatrous? Why is it women who are going outside the tribe? Why is it women who must be punished by God? Because women represented the female side of divine. None of this makes me any more peaceful with Isaiah, oh, Hosea, by the way. All of this makes me more judgy and wrathful. 
Do you know the damage you're doing, Hosea, by getting rid of a feminine face of God? Do you know the damage that will be done in the future to women? The violence that will be unleashed on the world? The incredible harm that will result from your taking away our ability, our right to see the feminine face of the divine. Do you know what you're doing? You put in many words, all of which Hosea called his people, by the way, for doing that. I found, is what I'm telling you, no peace in Hosea. I found, as I read that ancient book, that I was so judging him, judging other people who think like him, judging people who think that only one faith path is possible, that only one image of God is possible, that the denigration of women has nothing to do with religion. I was judging, I was opinionated, and I was not peaceful in my kingdom. God had sent me Hosea to practice exactly what I wanted to practice, not attaching meaning to something right away, but letting God unfold that meaning for me, keeping enough peace in my kingdom that I could be open to what life was bringing me. A book that you know I love called The Course in Miracles puts it this way. It says, you are so busy telling life what it should do and mean. You are not giving yourself an opportunity for life to tell you. That's what happens, isn't it, when we form an opinion, when we judge. As we said at the beginning, we stop thinking that there might be something else. We start thinking that we know the whole picture. And especially, we stop considering that this may be a part of God's perfect plan. Human beings cause harm but God can use it for our good, no question. It was interesting as I was reading Hosea and throwing it across the room. Oh, did I say I did it once? I might have done it more than that. I came across another book that I was reading intermittently these days called Togetherness. I've mentioned it before. It's a book written by a former Surgeon General of the United States. He had a section where he talked about what happens when we form an instant opinion. And it's not based on consulting our hearts. It's not based on openness to another idea. We simply go with what our brains tell us at that moment. The story was of a man who was in his middle ages and who had always worked in a bakery. He didn't own it. He was an employee. He served at the front counter and he worked with the other workers making the bread and pastries. Everybody loved him. He came in with a smile every day. He loved his co-workers. He enjoyed being with the customers who came regularly. He knew what they wanted. He knew who their kids were. He knew when they'd been on vacation. He was just a genuinely happy person. And then, wonder of wonders, almost like a reward for his goodness, he won the lottery, big time. And what did he do? Well, he instantly went with the opinion of the world. He did what the world tells him to do, immediately. He quit his job. You don't work at the bakery when you're a millionaire, billionaire. He bought a big house in a very fancy neighborhood. And within a year, he was depressed and showing up at his doctor with a variety of health issues. What had happened? What had happened? He had considered only the picture, the finite picture that the world presents of what happiness looks like. He had formed an opinion immediately about what a winner of a lottery does. And you can understand that, can't you? This is what we're told everybody wants, everybody should do. What he hadn't done was considered the whole picture, that he was losing his community. He was losing the people and associations that gave him meaning during the day. His new neighbors didn't come over and chat and were friendly. It's simply not the kind of life they lived. 
No wonder that within a year, that instant opinion he had formed through no fault of his own had started to harm him. He wasn't living in peace. He had formed an instant opinion and gone a difficult way. <laughs> so what does this have to do with Hosea? It is also the case that when God sends you things to work on, God sends you help to do it. So as these difficult things came up during the week for me, and I was thinking, I, today I form no opinions. I simply open myself to what life will teach me. Oh my gosh, when I started to look, I realized I was also getting what I needed to help me learn those lessons, see those lessons, and manage them to some extent with some success. And it even happened with Hosea. I was ready to throw the Bible against the wall again. I was ready to stand up today and say, we're not doing this book. It's nothing but bad. It's nothing but harmful. We're moving past this. In fact, let's not even do any of the prophets. I was ready to do that. I was telling myself that, oh, that was such an important thing to do because so many people in the world depend on me for ultimate wisdom. They don't, thank God. When suddenly I thought to myself, what if I stopped looking at Hosea through my opinion and start looking at Hosea through his? So I entered into that book again, and I pictured myself as a prophet in those times. I pictured my people being sent to a foreign country. I pictured us losing our culture all around me as we were assumed into that culture. I thought of parents in Canada who come from other lands and the pain they must often feel as their children leave aside treasured traditions and attitudes and head off into a scary world of being something different and new. I thought about what it feels like when I see my world change and some of the things that I love are lost. And I thought how much pain and fear Hosea must be living in as he experienced that same thing, as he lived in a world which seemed to be slowly taking away everything he thought he was and everything he thought God wanted from him. And I thought, what would I do? I would probably rail. I would probably cry. I would probably blame. But then I might do what Hosea actually finally manages to do. I would be able to say, but God will call me back through this. God will be there for me in this. Hosea says, it's okay, Israel. You may have done the worst thing you could do. And again, I felt along with him, oh my gosh, yes, I have done sometimes the things that are the worst thing I think I could do. And yet Hosea says, it's okay. God forgives you. I do not mean for a moment that Hosea and I see eye to eye about what's important in the world what's helpful in the world, what's inclusive in the world. I for sure don't agree with him on so many fundamental things, like the idea that God can be found in different ways, imagined in different pictures, and worshipped in different names and ways. But I did end up with more peace. As I realized that the book of Isaiah could open for me compassion for people who are losing things they treasure and are afraid for the future. And I could also open to Isaiah and find peace in the idea that like the people he, around him who he thinks are doing the worst thing they could do, I have felt that way, that I have done the worst thing I could do, that we are doing some of the worst things we could do. I'm grateful to Hosea for reminding me that God will always be there for us always ready to continue that journey with us, always ready to companion us, always ready to teach us, show us the bigger picture, help us find that way to peace. So, did I manage to rule my mind, which I alone can rule? I will tell you, I managed to see that if I want peace, I gotta be prepared for God sending me lessons that true, uh, require me to practice peace. And did I manage to say, today 
I will hold no judgments of anything that occurs. No, I didn't manage it. But I did manage to remind myself that I don't know the whole picture, that I always have an opportunity to say, God, I know there is something different here for me. Don't let me judge before I have seen what good you want to share here. And I know that ultimately the peace in my mind comes from that simple surrender of my life and circumstances to God. Of course I'll still work for good. Of course I'll still stand up against people like Hosea. But I will also keep the peace in my mind of not thinking I know the whole story and being grateful to God who does. Thanks be to God. trust, hear our prayers. We mourn the death of Verna Hamill, age 101. She was our friend and fellow Roncesvalles United Church member. She was an epitome of friendship. Throughout her life, she nurtured her friendships, ready to meet a need if she could, to offer comfort, to give a helping hand, to make us laugh. We give thanks for the remarkable life that she lived. We pray for Afghanistan, for the families who have been able to leave. It will be a difficult transition. We pray that organizations and community groups will have the resources to help refugees adjust to a new home. For those waiting to leave, we pray that a way can be devised for them to safely do so. For those who remain in their homeland, we pray that they will be able to retain their freedoms achieved after 20 years. We pray for our American neighbors in Louisiana and Mississippi as they repair the damage and rebuild after devastating Hurricane Ida. And in contrast, we pray for Canadian farmers in the West facing drought and shrinking harvests. Our planet confounds us and we hope for a greedy determination to live with respect in creation. We pray for our older teens, many of whom are leaving home again to return to their colleges. We pray that these children and grandchildren can pursue their studies safely and work towards their goals, free from cumbersome restrictions. Keep us focused on protecting our health and the health of a community. Comfort those who are still losing family members because of COVID and its variants. We silently name those we care about who need to know they are loved. I pray for two young men who, because of too much alcohol, spent night, the night hours on our steps recently. May they be given direction and goals. Shauna's brother and his wife have been contacted and are well. We share Shauna's relief. We pray for Mac as she moves to a new place today, closer to us. We pray each one that we will be open to your Holy Spirit, willing to seek equality and justice for all. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today at Roncesvalles United Church. Next Sunday, September 12th, The Big Pivot. We'll see you in church at 10.30 a.m. on September 12th, or join us online on Sunday evening, September 12th, for a recorded version of the morning service. Whichever way you join us, we hope that you'll feel a part of this community, and we hope you'll remember that God blesses us all wherever we are. And now may the love of God 
and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide upon us, everyone, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next Sunday. Thank you.